It's my great pleasure to be able to introduce our three panelists. Let me begin with Arden Crystal. Arden Crystal is the president and CEO of South Lake Regional Health Center in Newmarket, Ontario. Arden started her career as a registered nurse in medical and surgical oncology. She has a bachelor of science degree in nursing and a master's of health administration, both from the University of British Columbia. Arden has also completed the Managing Health Delivery Certificate Program at Harvard University. Prior to her arrival at Southlake, Arden held senior executive operations roles at two of the largest health authorities in British Columbia, the Fraser Health Authority and the Provincial Health Services Authority with responsibilities spanning the full continuum of care, including public health, acute community, tertiary and quaternary research and academic organizations. Her portfolios also included responsibility for non-clinical services such as quality risk and human resources. And she has overseen as clinical executive sponsor, major public private partnerships or P3 capital projects in the hospital sector. So please join me in welcoming Arden Crystal to our panel. Next, we have Connie Clarice. And Connie is the executive chair and founder of Closing the Gap Healthcare. Connie began her career as a registered nurse with a Bachelor of Health Science in Nursing. She has continued to prioritize lifelong learning and routinely participates in leadership and business training programs at Ivy, Rotman and Shulich Business Schools. In addition to her role as an adjunct professor at the University of Toronto's Institute of Health Policy, Management and Evaluation, Connie sits as a board member or advisor at the Ivy Business School, Ivy's Pierre Mosseret Institute for Entrepreneurship, Salus Global Corporation, Women of Influence and Trans Research Labs. Connie's contributions to healthcare, entrepreneurship, and the business community have been acknowledged through numerous awards, including the 2012 Mississauga Board of Trade Business Award of Excellence and the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal. Please join me in welcoming Connie. Esther Mogadam holds the dual roles of Chief Nursing Officer and Director of Health Promotion at Ottawa Public Health. She also serves as an academic advisor with the University of Ottawa School of Nursing, an advisor for Loyer de Silva Chair in Public Population Health Risk Assessment and Management. Please join me in welcoming all of our panelists. Thank you very much, Vanessa. Sorry for that delay. I think we're all adjusting to this new world of uh, virtual conferencing. Uh, my name is Arden Crystal, and thank you so much for inviting me here today. Um, there is no, uh, I, I don't think anybody would argue with me uh, when I say our world is changing, uh, and uh, in so many ways. And hmm, start my video just a minute. I want to make sure I'm good. Okay. Uh, and it's fueled by a global economy, advances in technology, changes in cultural beliefs and values, and of course, presently by the COVID-19 pandemic. And it's uh, often a challenge for public services, whether that be healthcare, education, governments, to be nimble and changing. Uh, we are so often reactive instead of proactive. And let's face it, change is hard. However, we know that when faced with a true crisis, like COVID, most people are capable of changing quickly. They just need a burning platform. And our job as health executives is really to set the stage for change, to identify those burning platforms so that our organizations can come aboard. Artificial intelligence uh, is one of those advances that we need to prepare for. And it's something that in fact has already been quietly infiltrating healthcare for some time now whether it is predictive algorithms programmed into triage software, wearables that alarm remotely, or the simulation software we utilize in our own uh, RN simulation training labs, AI is not going away. In, in this session, I've been asked to focus on how executives should be inspiring and supporting AI in clinical practice, 
So I'd like to focus on the impacts to the delivery system, how I think nurses' roles will need to evolve, and what executives can specifically do to advance adoptions. All of that in five minutes. So uh, here we go. <laughs> First of all, impacts to the healthcare system. Um, you know, global shortages of trained professionals have really added steam to the already burgeoning knowledge economy and the rise of technologically based virtual care, um, things like machine learning. Um, we know that aging populations and longer lifespans are going to continue to put pressure on the healthcare system requiring new ways of providing care. We're not going to be simply be able to take care of everybody in a hospital or a long-term care facility. And, and costs are rising, and that really necessitates new ways of working and less variability in cost structures. And using AI can provide poten potentially more predictable care processes and outcomes. And this predictability often reduces costs. So how will a nurse's role change? Well, it's my belief that a nurse that nurses' roles are always in some state of change, given the outside forces in healthcare um, that we're susceptible to. Uh, whether it is increasing uh, patient and family engagement in care, which which has served to increase the teaching and mentoring role of a nurse, whether it's increased technology, which changes the way nurses assess and intervene with patients, or whether it's learning to work in team-based settings where all providers work at top of scope. With the adoption of AI, what I think we're going to see is that the nurse becomes the inf information integrator, the health coach, and kind of retains that human touch. I don't think we're going to see robots all independently uh, doing nursing care. But, uh, and so AI is not going to be supplanting nursing, but it will be supporting decision making in a big way, which uh, ideally should free up the nurse for other, uh, for other activities. An example of this would be maybe the use of machine learning and predictive analytics uh, to proactively intervene with patients before they deteriorate in a much more robust way than we already do. Um, you know, we have teams that go around to try and uh, anticipate uh, a, patient, uh, a patient's needs before they code, um, but, uh, but we're still a ways behind and probably getting ahead of that as much as we could. Uh, so leading the change, um, you know, as I'm sure you all know, and as I mentioned in the intro, the first step in enacting any change, especially these, those kinds of changes that, implement, uh, that directly impact someone's job, is to make the case that change is needed and unavoidable. And it's likely that nurses and other care providers will react with some level of skepticism, fear of job loss, and fear of losing that personal touch. So as leaders, I think there are some things that we can do to make this happen. First, I think we need to ensure that we cultivate a growth and innovation mindset in our organizations. That means taking some risks, supporting failures, and setting some stretch goals. I think second, we need to share stories of usefulness. For example, how technology and AI support the nurse to make faster and better decisions. And we do have some data to back that up. It's a, it's a growing data pool. Um, but, you know, um, one of the things that we know about adult learners is they need to know the why behind the change. And so these stories of usefulness would be very important. The third thing I think we can focus on is time. I mean, we know that there are a lot of studies out there that indicate that anywhere from 10 to even up to 20% of a nurse's time is still occupied with so-called non-nursing duties. And how can AI help the nurse regain some of that time? Uh, and, and the last thing, you know, really help nurses adapt to becoming more of a coach as opposed to a doing role. And uh, we'd have to, obviously, we're gonna have to implement some more education to help them adapt. And, you know, I would say for sure that communication is key here. Um, be trans we need to be transparent and honest we need to answer questions to the best of our ability as leaders. It really helps to provide, uh, to, to establish trust um, and to, to prepare them for the change. We're gonna have to be tenacious, um, constantly reassuring and providing reinforcement and follow-up. You know, we all know that new ways of working take significant time to take hold. Um, most change initiatives fail not due to the implementation themselves, but to the lack of follow-up to make sure that the change is stuck. And in, above all, lead using the shared values of the organization, be honest, try to lessen the unknowns, 
to reduce people's anxieties and, um, and to recognize and support losses while also praising successes. Um, you know, I, I've always found that it's okay to admit that you're sad uh, to be losing a way of working um, and, and, uh, and that, that you have to enact staff changes. It doesn't mean that you're admitting to not supporting the change. It just means you're human and has feelings. I think that resonates with staff. And I think you need to listen to the staff sharing those feelings as well um, and, and sharing their ideas for how uh, this can be a more successful uh, change uh, as you move into adopting more AI. So to close this short introductory talk, I'm excited about the changes yet to come in healthcare. As a NERTH executive, I think it's going to be fun to play a role in leading these changes. And I look forward to the rest of the panel discussion. Um, so, uh, and I look forward to your questions. So thank you very much for inviting me to participate and I'll hand it back to um, the next speaker and look forward to your questions. Thanks very much. Good afternoon, everyone. First, I wanna thank RNAO and AMS for the opportunity to speak about artificial intelligence and compassionate care on this panel of esteemed leaders. I will be speaking about artificial intelligence in the home care sector. Over the course of my career, nurses have adapted to the introduction of multiple technology solutions. We have consistently demonstrated our passion for humanity throughout the years of constant change in healthcare. We know that implementing accountable care requires that we marry artificial intelligence with compassionate care. In my experience, it is tempered leadership acting with integrity while collaborating with all stakeholders that has formed the foundation of success while introducing AI. As leaders in the home healthcare sector, we also need to understand the importance of ensuring that AI is married with the frontline delivery of compassionate care. This is a significant but essential shift. AI should be used to maximize the impact and effectiveness of human interactions between patients and healthcare providers. It should not be viewed as an alternative to a human interaction. As healthcare professionals, we need to understand that electronic systems are simply tools that should enable the care process. We've only begun to scratch the surface and there's lots of work and opportunity that lies ahead. The public is asking and often demanding improvements in accessing care and services. This includes modernizing how we deliver care. Clients and families need to be active partners in the interventions and not passive recipients of care. Particularly in home care, where there's, no, there's so much diversity in how people live their lives. The home care workforce is a mobile one that is also geographically dispersed. So our teams rarely interface face to face. Perhaps more so than any other sector, care delivery in the community can be enabled to work in a team environment across the continuum, though through connected information systems. All clinicians involved in the episode of care would then have access to the same clin clinical information in real time. The expansion of virtual consultations would enable all frontline care providers at the bedside to access the clinical expertise of nurses who have specialized training in areas such as palliative care, wound care, infusion therapy, and cancer care, just to name a few. These clinicians would also have the required expertise in the most up-to-date best practices and specialty certifications. Going one step further would be to grant patients and families access to information and to offer greater influence in areas such as scheduling, frontline worker identity and qualifications, and input into the development of care plans. And enhanced monitoring could minimize risk by improving the ability to identify early issues that re can reduce ED visits, impact recovery, or identify new health challenges. This will require clinician autonomy to determine benefits of such monitoring, along with the trust by, of both clinicians and patients that this level of monitoring would pr produce positive health outcomes and reduce the financial burden on the sector as a whole. We must increase awareness within the healthcare system, especially among system leaders 
on the need for investments in modernization to achieve gains and improve outcomes for the healthcare system as a whole. I would be remiss if I did not mention the need to focus on the health human resource capacity challenges we face. With the average age of a registered nurse hovering around 45 years, we must think about how we actively transfer knowledge and support younger clinicians while modernizing care delivery. There is a role for expanding AI in home care to assist with this issue. We are all aware that seniors care and the complexities we face with comorbidities is real. We must be able to deliver compassionate care in this new world where artificial intelligence will soon be a core service within all modern home care delivery systems. Clients and families will require education on the use of technology to ensure it's correctly utilized and that it provides the necessary confidence to all stakeholders to allow for home and community-based care. AI will also assist with managing HR capacity and service volumes through the introduction of new models of care that safely meet the needs of every patient in a safe and ethical manner. Safe care is the best care. Through the use of data analytics and promoting clinical involvement in the development of information systems, we will ensure better care is delivered and better outcomes are achieved. Working collaboratively with IT specialists, but also promoting the role of health informatics specialists will ensure systems are best designed for good care. During COVID-19, virtual care options allowed safe care during a pandemic, along with the better use of the reduced health human resources for certain types of care. This, this allowed organizations to leverage specialty staff. In the longer term, AI will enable meaningful process data. If standardized nationally, Canada, uh, or Canada is far behind other jurisdictions in this area. The data collected will better enable research and subsequent informed decision-making that will provide a path to better health outcomes, accountability, and transparency across the country. Standardized information at the point of care will also allow for better quality and patient outcomes measurement that will inevitably improve the care that is delivered. Home care would benefit from the expert opinions provided by RNAO and AMS on how to improve the care journey through the successful marriage of AI and compassionate care. Positioning technology in the context of compassionate care requires ongoing rigor and focus to reinforce this perspective and realize it at scale. Our public funders investment in AI and home care has been neg negligible and largely been limited to the referral process. The reality is that care is delivered by home care for, is delivered in the home by providers and the information at the point of care is valuable data and is where health outcomes can be most influenced. Government investment is urgently needed. Thank you very much for allowing me to present and for considering my opinion. Good afternoon and thank you so much for this invitation to speak and, and to be part of this distinguished panel uh, and symposium uh, with I think I saw over 200 participants. Um, I am so pleased to be here to add a public health nursing lens to our discussion on nursing leadership considerations with the integration of AI into clinical practice this afternoon and to, to add uh, to uh, some of the recommendations on how we can all move forward together. I do need to state up front that my views and opinions on this issue uh, do not necessarily reflect the view of my em employer, Ottawa Public Health. So uh, in public health, uh, we spend a lot of time trying to understand what makes some people healthier than others. And according to the WHO, lifestyle contributes 60% to health. That's of course a huge number, making this a top priority in our population health efforts.
Now, there is no doubt that AI has a role to play in the health promotion space. And you just need to look at Google and see how quickly they've moved uh, and aggressive, moved aggressively into healthcare and uh, wellness areas. Uh, right now, there's some really great AI already in our smartphones, our vehicles, and on our wrists as Fitbit watches, helping people manage their health and understand more about personal wellness uh, issues that uh, public health cares about. And of course, we all care about. And municipal, provincial, and federal governments are loving it, uh, but not necessarily for the right reason. So here is where I'm going to get a bit controversial. Without strong leadership, I think I, the health of populations, I don't know uh, if they'll be better off um, with, with AI. Um, I have not seen strong evidence that AI is going to solve our population health challenges just yet. Now, having said that, uh, I do want to, um, I would do want us just for a second, uh, imagine the pandem pandemic if we didn't have Zoom and other technologies to support virtual care. It would be a very different pandemic with even greater barriers to care and even more uh, severe uh, economic impact. So I'm not disputing the technology. It's a new leadership lens, I think, that will be needed to implement, uh, to, to impact rather uh, population health levels with AI. So I just want to talk about two examples. Uh, the first one being the COVID Alert app. Uh, Canada's release of the COVID Alert app was greeted with great praise and fanfare. Many of you have likely downloaded the app on your smartphones, of course, depending on where you live in Canada, because not all provinces have agreed to sign on. Uh, the COVID exposure notification tool, like the Health Canada app, I think has uh, limited value um, in the care process. Uh, it doesn't allow public health to identify people who have been exposed to uh, infected individuals, and the app itself is, is prone to false negatives. So while you can argue that, uh, that this is a step forward in contact tracing, um, I think the real problem uh, with the COVID app is that rather than targeting the group's most vulnerable to COVID transmission. It focuses on those less likely to spread uh, COVID, namely those who can afford smartphones, data plans, and are not living in dense congregate living conditions. I'd like to talk about a second example, uh, this one related to healthy eating and active living uh, and um, focused on um, lifestyle. And this is Google. So as I mentioned, Google is entering the space in a big way using the science of nudging. Uh, with a Google AI platform, uh, you no longer have to make an active choice to exercise or even how to eat. Google will record your current behavior and through your watch or your phone, nudge you to walk more. Now, from the perspective of government, this sounds uh, wonderful. Wouldn't it be easier if public health could just tell everyone through Google to eat more vegetables and walk more? Uh, and a new type of behavior intervention would be possible uh, to solve obesity. And some people are actually thinking that this, this is a reality. Um, however, it's one thing to be told by an app to walk more, but it won't solve the problem of infrastructure if there is no place, uh, if there is no place to, to walk. Uh, if we're serious about uh, healthier options um, related to healthy eating and physical activity, um, we all know that we need to have access to fresh food, design walkable communities, and design buildings to promote stair use, tax unhealthy foods such as pop and other sugar sweetened beverages, and ban advertising to children. Now, I think AI will allow us to have some very sophisticated and original interventions in everyday life that will promote health, but it's not going to fix everything by digitally quantifying, tracking, or gamifying our health promoting behaviors and improving the health of populations. But having said all that, I am cautiously optimistic about the future of AI and have uh, three closing thoughts so where I think strong leadership will be needed if we move forward or as we move forward, because uh, I think that's, of course, a reality. Number one, we need to be, as nursing leaders, we need to be very clear about the problem we're trying to solve with AI and even understand how it became a problem in the first place. Um, ensuring, ensure that the problem is well understood. That's so critical. Identifying a solution um, without fully understanding the problem is not good. Uh, technology will become a trap. I think if we focus on the technology's design rather than its 
if effect and impact on the population it was supposedly designed to address, um, we're going to have um, we're, we're we're going to have a lot of uh, a, a disappointments, false starts, and uh, it's uh, not going to be the the panacea that I think um, some of us think that it may be, and such as our experience right now with Canada's uh, COVID tracing app. Number two, we need to focus on the benefits to all people, not just a few. So this, I think, will require us to ensure nurse and client involvement in the design and development of AI tools. We must ensure that AI benefits client care, particularly for those that face the greatest barriers, risks, and low levels of technology literacy. Nurses can bring the client voice to the table, um, but it's even better to have clients themselves at the table. Nothing for me without me. Uh, if it can't work for all at the very, if it can't work for all, at the very least, AI technology tools must work for those who need it the most. Then lastly, I think we need to appraise and understand where AI can be reasonably applied. The belief that, an, that AI is a cure-all tool that will magically deliver solutions to solve population health problems like obesity is misleading, and I'm afraid will prevent other more effective solutions from being implemented earlier or even explored. Evaluation uh, is a component that just can't be forgotten. Thank you, and I look forward to uh, your questions and panel discussion. Back to you, Vanessa. All right, we're back. Thank you so much to our three panelists, to Arden, to Connie, and of course to Esther for those very interesting insights across three different sectors, Arden in the acute care sector, and Connie in the home care sector, and Esther from the public health sector. So I think that's, uh, I mean, it's an enriching opportunity to have colleagues today from across all sectors to provide their views on um, this most important topic. Um, one of the things that I wanna do before we get into, I'm sure you have lots of questions, but um, let me just go back and summarize what I think, and I hope I do justice to all of you um, when I summarize for the audience, again, some of the key points that I, I, I took uh, from your respective talks. And um, let me begin with uh, Arden's talk about um, the implications uh, of AI that's quietly but steadily been infiltrating the healthcare system. And I love the way Arden put that because it's so true that there was a point in time where it was a very subtle, quiet infiltration. And now we see sort of the explosion that's starting to happen. Um, and ergo, the reason why I think this is, uh, symposium today is so important. Arden talked about um, the health system impact and about um, issues regarding supply of health human resources and new ways of delivering care and how all of that is significant uh, through this infiltration of AI. She um, talked specifically about um, how this is um, affecting nurses and that um, one of the things that nurses will need to hold on to and must hold on to is the aspect of coaching, um, the art of being able to interact uh, with others on that level um, to maintain the sense of uh, human touch and, and the spirit of compassion. And then the other really significant piece is of course around change management and how all of us as leaders and in general will need to be able to understand um, where uh, we will have to intervene to shepherd these changes into the system. Um, and then uh, Connie. Connie talked uh, to us about what I think is um, a lovely statement about how AI needs to be married uh, with compassion uh, in frontline care, uh, not as an alternative, not as a replacement. It is simply uh, one of the tools now that we have to accept as part of uh, our practice as part of care delivery. So um, I think that that was a really nice way of, uh, of putting it. And Connie also talked about um, how um, at the, at the end of the day, if we have um, healthcare technology, AI that becomes uh, useful and 
really doesn't interfere with our ability to uh, deliver continuously compassionate care, that the data that we can derive uh, because of these technological systems will be very helpful in improving health outcomes, uh, in building better care paths for people. And so those were the key points I took there that I thought were really important. Um, and Esther, Esther, from a public health perspective, I loved uh, the comment that you made about uh, AI will not solve our population health issues. My own background, I have the public health background from many years ago. Um, and I think that that was a really strong and important point that you made. And then Esther gave a couple of, of examples around this, the COVID-19 alert and, um, and Google and how they're using uh, uh, Google applications to nudge people to do um, uh, certain things to um, increase behaviors in certain areas. But I think that the real takeaway from Esther's talk was um, the fact that we will need strong leadership to really understand what the problem is that we're actually trying to solve um, and whether or not um, AI can in fact be used effectively to solve that problem. We, we, Esther alluded to the fact that she doesn't want a diversion from development of, of uh, solutions to the real problems. And so I thought that that was a very interesting take on that. Did I get that right? I hope I got, I hope I summarized well for all of you, but I mean, for, for me, and I'm sure there are many other incredible takeaways from, from your talks, but I wanted to start with that just to remind uh, everybody of what I think are some of the, the salient points across uh, each of your respective talks. Um, I want to um, ask that if you have questions, please feel free um, I invite questions into the chat box. Did I, I hope I said that right, Rita? Um, Rita and I will do the best we can to identify those questions and um, uh, read them out so that uh, um, we can ask the panelists what their, uh, what their opinions are around them. Um, and I have the first question now from the audience. Uh, and the question is, how could AI support workflows for transitional care models that support patients and family engagement and improved experience? And so I would invite any of the panelists to respond to this question. How do we use AI support? How does AI support the workflows for transitional care models that support patients and family engagement and improved experience? Any thoughts from uh, any of the panelists on that? Hi, it's, it's funny, I can go first if, if that's okay. And I think that's a, a very valuable uh, question. And I think it's very important that to, as we create our, our strategic priorities uh, with the um, implementation of AI, it's also important to think about how we currently communicate between all sectors. So my response to that question is this is an excellent way to have all uh, health systems communicating effectively without having mediators um, in the middle. So acute care can speak directly with uh, clinicians and uh, frontline service delivery on how to transition uh, a patient out of the hospital and back into the community or long-term care, wherever they are going. But to have that com communication and that sharing of um, uh, clinical information um, directly between all frontline um, providers. Yeah, I'm just gonna weigh in uh, around the transition, specifically the transition I know the most about, which is from acute care to uh, either transitional care to, uh, to home care, to long-term care. And one of the challenges I think that we, uh, that, that in a busy hospital sector that we have is sometimes better anticipating uh, the actual timing of the progress of the patient and when that patient or resident will be actually ready to go to the next step. And I think AI and some of those uh, decision-making algorithms could help us with that, uh, which then helps us get our planning done well in advance 
and then helps to have a smoother transition. Um, you know, we've been uh, working on some programs at South Lake where we're doing that using our noggins uh, and we're pretty good actually, but I think uh, we could probably make that faster and easier with AI potentially uh, if they are populated, if the algorithms are populated correctly. Thank you, Arden. Esther, did you want to weigh in? Sure, thank you. Uh, so, okay. so for me, this goes back to what is the problem we're trying to solve? Uh, so uh, when I think about transitions, one of the challenges that we see in public health are our are, are new, uh, new parents, new, mo new moms, new dads uh, with a newborn that's uh, really um, struggling with uh, issues around housing. Uh, support, isolation, uh, breastfeeding. Um, so in terms of workflow, how can that be built in? Maybe it's about doing sort of discharge planning at the in advance of, of that. Um, so we can get all our ducks in a row and really engage clients in the process to identify what the need is, what is the key issue. I mean, that can really, I think, facilitate the transition and uh, possibly, um, you know, lead to uh, some of the much better outcomes. I, I feel in uh, as a public health nurse, we're constantly, um, we're not constantly, we're often trying to catch up with these new families postpartum, particularly those that are facing um, extraordinary uh, challenges in their life. Thank you, Esther. Uh, we have another question that was posted. The question is, uh, well, first a statement, complexity is across sectors and how do you see AI linking the patient's experience and the health team? So how do you see AI linking the patient's experience and the health team? Any thoughts? Um, so uh, maybe from an acute care perspective, once again, I guess, uh, certainly in, you know, a, a lot of the literature that I've read and some of the experiences that I know that my colleagues in, in other hospitals are having, uh, particularly, I think, in some of the U.S. hospitals, is that they really are starting to use AI um, as sort of an early warning system. Um, so right now, you know, we, as I mentioned in my talk, we have uh, early response teams that, that get called to say a medical unit uh, where they come in and they intervene with a patient that seems to be deteriorating. Um, but remember that there's so much of the patient's deterioration that occurs before those overt signs of deterioration are evident to us. So I think you know, that's a way to link health teams into a swifter uh, response to, uh, to the patient so that we can uh, prevent them from getting into, um, you know, a, a deeper trouble and, and potentially into a point of no return right. in terms of their physical condition. Yeah, um, that's right. one that just occurs to me right off the get-go. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Um, there have been a number of comments that speak to how uh, important it is to prepare the practicing and future nursing workforce for this digital healthcare transformation. Um, so the simple question around that is, how can nurse leaders support and lead this? What can we do as nurse leaders to ensure that the future nursing workforce is prepared for this digital health transformation. Um, hi. hi. Okay. Um, and so um, my opinion on, on, on this is, is to start from the very beginning when you're developing your strategy. And that's where uh, nurse leaders will be, will be um, very important to support um, other clinicians to make sure that if there are committees reviewing or developing a strategy, that there are frontline nursing care providers on every committee as well as patients. And I think that is the best way to begin uh, understanding what that frontline clinician is, experience is like and what it will take to operationalize any strategic plan that includes AI um, on the front lines. Excellent. Esther or Arden, do you want to weigh in? 
Uh, sure. Um, thanks for that. It's a it's a great it's a great question. I think um, I from a public health perspective, I think really understanding um, what contributes to health and not losing sight of that. Uh, you know, um, we have nurses. I think nursing has to lead our choice in terms of what kind of data, what kind of uh, um, data we're we're recording in the first place, um, and and you know how, how we can't pr and and just as an example, um, you know, as an example, uh, we are um, we're collecting a lot of data on uh, COVID, and uh, with one exception, and that's about. Uh, racialized populations, the populations that are most impacted by COVID. So I think that is a that is a, uh, a a huge contribution that nurses have to be ready for, and that just fundamentally, I think um, we need to really prepare uh, our future workforce in truly understanding social determinants of health and and right. uh, and and barriers and marginalized populations. Yes, great. Thanks, Esther. Um, and I, I will, final word on that. I, I would say and I, um, that we haven't been incredibly great in the past uh, in anticipating um, the, the changes until they actually arrive. Um, and that's just because, again, change is hard, but also particularly when it is a change that, um, that changes a person's own role. Uh, people get very married to their roles, uh, and uh, and and it's hard to change that sometimes. I think that we're going to have to start those changes early on in in nurses training, so that they're uh, fully prepared uh, for the kinds of supports. But I want to go back to what Esther said, which is, what are the problem we're trying to solve? So, so we should only institute AI if it truly can be shown that it improves quality or that it helps us deal with a significant um, skilled nursing shortage. And we think we're gonna have a skilled, we've already got a shortage. Um, that's probably going to continue based on uh, the demand in the system. And so, you know, those are the kinds of things we have to start with. And so if the goal is how can we use AI to help to um, compensate for some of that shortage by taking away some of the things that nurses are doing now that we think AI could help with, well then that's the way we have to try and, and lead the change and we have to, to educate people around, this is why we're doing it and this is what the end game is. Um, and and the, on the opposite, if it's all about quality, then start with where the quality gaps are and then be clear about how AI can really make a difference in that. Um, I, I don't think we're gonna get anywhere unless we kind of start with why. That's great, Arden. Thank you. We've only got four minutes left. I can't believe that this has just flown by. But there are a couple more uh, questions on, on the chat group. I know I had some questions too, but I want to allow the audience to ask their questions first. So the first question is about, um, you know, ensuring the engagement of frontline clinicians. So the question is, in your experience, how often are physicians chosen over or instead of nurses? And then um, how do we get um, nurses to the table, um, particularly considering that nurses make up the largest um, workforce body uh, in healthcare? Um, you know what? I think that um, maybe uh, Arden, I'm going to put you on the spot and start and, and weigh in on this one for us. Yes. Uh, so, um, I think that there probably is uh, a still some uh, outdated, uh, perhaps rooted in a certain amount of sexism, uh, <laughs> but uh, I think perspective that somehow um, physicians are more technically oriented and would understand it more, I, that has not been my experience. Um, so, you know, yeah. I, I I, I think we just have to fight it like we have to fight all kinds of different um, gender stereotypes. And I think we've kind of got the same thing going on here. Yeah, I think um, our, my experience is very similar. Um, we actually have a, um, an approach here where uh, we don't initiate any change in our uh, technology unless 
uh, we have all the stakeholders at the table and that includes nurses, physicians. I mean, it could include clerks. It could, it includes anybody that needs to be at the table. So I, I think that though, uh, the, the point around it is that um, as nurse leaders, that it is our role to advocate to ensure that the proper representation is around the table. And um, so thank you for that. Um, I, I do have a question that uh, I'm gonna take the liberty of, of asking. Um, and it's really about uh, something that actually Arden, Arden said and uh, Esther alluded to, and it's about um, the integration of AI technology for the sake of technology. And um, we've had lots of conversation here at, at Humber about that technology for the sake of technology in trying to develop a very principled approach as Arden uh, suggested, where um, we look at how that technology will impact our providers and impact our patients and families. And if it brings value in terms of quality and safety and, the, and those sorts of things. So the, the question that I will pose to all of you is that given that we have as, as nurse leaders um, recognize this, how do we safeguard in our organizations against the integration of AI technology for the sake of technology? So what do we do to influence that? How can we influence that? Esther, do you wanna start? Uh, it takes courage. <laughs> That's the first thing that comes to mind. Uh, technology is front and center in our, in our uh, Board of Health strategic plan. It is uh, part of the direction of local governments. It really is seen, uh, seen as, um, you know, as a panacea for another, for a lot of solutions. Uh, I, I think that, um, I think that uh, we, um, it, we, we go back uh, for, for, for our organization. Uh, I use our principles and our values uh, for going back when we're in the initial stages of design and development and that that should really guide, uh, you know, guide our decision making and ensure the, and ensure the voice, not just of practitioners, those, those at the front line, but also the voice, the clients is, is, uh, is, part of, uh, is part of the process. But it takes a lot of courage to challenge. Like we get very swept up with the functionality and Wait. totally lose sight of what it is we're trying to solve. Totally and then we don't it. even evaluate it because we're so excited that Google and Apple have stepped forward to hand us a solution without any cost and we embrace it and we don't even know what it's doing. And they just tell us, they tell us, they give us oodles of background and telling us how it's uh, protecting privacy. We get so swept up on how great it's protecting our privacy, but, but no one asks the question, what is... What, 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 what's the purpose? What's the problem? What are we trying to do? How is the population going to be better off? And that takes courage. And that's the, uh, that's, um, uh, at, again, courage pointing to values of your organization can help. Sorry, I went on there. No, no, thank you. Thank you, uh, Esther. And uh, uh, you look like a woman with courage. <laughs> May I add a, a couple of comments about that? Do we have time? Of course, of course, okay. yes, please, please go ahead. So in, in the home care environment, the business model that we operate under is a fee-for-service model. So we don't have funds uh, sitting around that uh, can be um, put into AI. Um, and any um, projects that we take on that would include artificial intelligence, and one big one has been in the wound care um, field, um, has to clearly um, demonstrate positive health outcomes for our, our patients and improve the workflow uh, for our staff. Um, so it, it's unfortunate um, that uh, we're at the mercy of our funders um, to implement uh, new technologies and uh, to be able to find uh, funding to do so within the home care space. Thank, thank you, Connie. All right, well, um... It, again, uh, let me say uh, my sincere thanks to each of the panelists for um, your very uh, sage and um, insightful comments around this topic. I know I certainly have 
learned a lot today and the, and the, the dialogue was certainly very engaging. Um, I have to be the one that says that this session is over, even though we have lots of people that have lots more questions and are very interested in this topic, but I'm sure that uh, given RNEO's role and um, MI's role in all of this, we, um, we're hoping to hear more. So um, thank you again to the panelists. Thank you to our wonderful audience who made so many great comments and asked so many great questions. Um, we, of course, invite all of you to stay for the next session, which I, I know will be just as uh, interesting and, and inspiring. Thank you all so very much.